Julie. We're delighted to have with us as our speaker today, Dr. Linda Bartoshuk. Uh, Dr. Bartoshuk uh, is a professor in the food in the Department of Nutrition and Food, something or other at IFAS. Uh, but what's more important is that she's one of the world's experts on the psychology involved in taste. And uh, she was uh, trained as an undergraduate uh, uh, in Minnesota at Carleton, and she did her graduate work, I think, at Brown. And uh, she somehow got involved in stuff in Boston. I met her husband, who was in physics, uh, and the rest of it's a long story. But in any event, for many years, uh, they were at Yale. And then, fortunately for us, around 10 years ago, uh, they moved to the University of Florida. And uh, Linda uh, has a renown in her field. She's been uh, the president of uh, many of the leading uh, psychological societies that are involved in this area, including the American Psychological Association. Uh, and I'm sure she's a distinguished professor here or something like that. Uh, so we're delighted to have Dr. Bartoshek here. Welcome, Linda. Would you rather that I stayed up here for your taping? I can switch cameras. Okay, great. And then you let me know when you want your PowerPoint up. Yeah, right, let's put it on, yeah. Okay. Building two, 1218. Well, I'm Linda Summerfield here at Okamak, and I tell you, getting a chance to lecture to Okamak people is amazing. Uh, first of all, most of you are not specialists in my field, which makes you fearless about asking questions. Okay, and uh, you will ask questions that I've never heard before sometimes, and they are very, very, very useful. So I'll tell you, I'm perfectly happy to be interrupted with questions any time, and I'll try to leave some time at the end. Um, we had a little mix up in scheduling, and until about 10.30 this morning, I didn't know I was giving this lecture <laughs> because I was planning for next week. And it's actually an interesting experience. As a teacher, you get used to this kind of, but it was, it was interesting to see how much time I really needed. But the problem here is I've put together things that I use for teaching. And some of the slides are going to be busier. I would have made them prettier for you. But they are what they are. So if there's any problem, let me know. And let's see forward. Uh, this is just an overview of what I'm going to try to do. I, I admit, shamefully, I'm taking advantage of this crowd because I'm going to tell you about some very new work in flavor. I'm going to tell you some things about flavor that you won't read in any textbook, and you probably wouldn't hear from anyone else. And if you told someone else who's an expert in flavor, they'd probably laugh and say it's crazy. But um, one of the beauties of being at the University of Florida and being with people who are in horticulture and I have access to stimuli for chemical senses I never had uh, before, is that we've been able to do some experiments that are really quite remarkable. I'm not going to tell you about all of them today, but I'm going to tell you about the results that they produced and what we now know about uh, taste and flavor. Um, so this may sound, by the way, would anybody like to tell me the definition of flavor as you know it? Nobody ever wants to. Um, if you look up flavor in a dictionary, it'll say it's an integration of taste and smell. It's some, the brain has somehow melded the two senses and that's flavor. That's bunk. It isn't correct. So I'm going to show you what is correct. And uh, if later on in the questions, if you get really interested, I can tell you some of the critical experiments. And in fact, I tried to come up with a demonstration of one of the critical experiments, but I couldn't get it. Um, it's a gum that has a compound in it that paralyzes sweet temporarily, and it's only sold in Israel, and I could not figure out a way to get it. 
um, I won't give up and maybe I'll have a chance for a future lecture. But anyway, I'm going to tell you what taste, smell, and flavor really do. I'm going to tell you why that's really important to nutrition and how we learned about it. And am I standing in your way? Um, and the chair is here because I have bad knees and I'm not sure how long I'm going to last on my feet, but I may sit down halfway through. Um, taste, smell, and flavor distinctions. This part is such fun. If you think about us, here we are, these poor organisms in the middle of this amazing environment, and the only way we know anything about it is through our senses. That's it. If there's something else going out there that you don't have a sense that can respond to, you're not going to know it. Um, we have distant senses, vision, audition, and smell, where we get things from a distance, and we other have others we call contact senses. But what I'm going to tell you about today is something very unusual about olfaction, because olfaction actually gives us two senses that should be considered completely different senses, and that's smell and flavor. I'll show you why. Um, if you go back to Aristotle, and we always do, he thought that taste and flavor were the same thing. If he put something in his mouth and it produced a sensation, that to him was taste. It didn't matter if it wasn't taste. I'll show you about that in a bit. Uh, if you inhaled it, it was smell. And that opinion held until 1810, if you can believe it. Now, let me show you what Aristotle didn't know. Aristotle didn't know that when we sniff and pull odors into the nose, they go up and hit the receptors way up there at the top, go into the part of the brain that handles smell and flavor. There we go. So when you sniff, your brain knows that what's coming in, it should go to smell. Now, when you put it, something in your mouth, the same volatiles that you smelled when it was outside here are going up the back. And they're going through an area called the retronasal space. They're hitting the same receptors. And they're going into the brain. But that information is processed in a different area. It's processed as flavor. Now, we only knew this fairly recently, thanks to good magnetic um, uh, imaging. And the fact is, the brain is in a quandary. There's information coming up the olfactory nerve. Some of it is smell, and some of it is flavor, and the two need to be processed in different areas. How does the brain know which sense is using it? Basically, you've got one olfactory nerve, and the senses of smell and flavor have to take turns using it. And the brain needs to know which sense is operating because the information is going to go to a different place and be processed by different rules. How does it know? We think sniffing is what cues the brain that it's olfaction, and taste is what cues the brain that it's flavor. Now, what do you think would happen in that case if you didn't have taste? Could the brain process olfactory information as flavor? The answer is, no. And my colleagues just find that startling because this is not the way we looked at it for so long. But in the laboratory here at the University of Florida, we've been able to take taste away. We use anesthetic. We use modifiers that alter taste, take one sense out, leave the other senses, uh, other qualities alone. And what happens is you lose flavor when you take taste away. Well, next week, I have a patient coming to see me from New York who is the first patient in my career I have encountered who has totally lost taste but has a normal olfactory system. Can she perceive flavor? No. And everybody else in my field predicts, well, of course she can perceive flavor. She's got her olfactory nerve. But she doesn't have the cue that tells the brain to process the incoming information in the flavor area, so she cannot perceive flavor. And I'm so looking forward to evaluating her because I've waited years to find somebody like this. Um, okay, we can demonstrate this, and that's what the candy's for. Now, I have to apologize. I was going to give you these delicious jumbo jelly beans that are just fabulous, and they were arriving in time for the lecture next week. So I looked around and found these bags of butterscotch candies. And boy, are these hard to open. 
Good luck if you could get it out. I finally got mine open. And they are sugar free because I'm diabetic and I don't have anything in the house that has sugar in it. And I'm going to tell you what to do first. Um, we can stop retronasal olfaction. We can stop those volatiles from going up the back and into the nose just by plugging your nose because that stops all the air currents. So what you're going to do, we'll talk it through first, you're going to hold your nose. You're going to put the candy in your mouth. You're going to keep your nose closed the entire time. If you let it open, it ruins this. So hold your nose tight. Then put the candy in, swish it around. It's not, you can't chew it like the one I wanted you to have. So you're going to have to suck on it a while and get the taste to come out. It should taste a little sweet, but you will not perceive any butterscotch. Now, you have to leave it in your mouth long enough. And then after you're sure you can taste it, swallow, not the candy, just your saliva, open your nose, butterscotch. For those of you at home, they're tasting candies, so you'll just have to imagine us here. <laughs> <laughs> now, did everybody get it? You don't taste the butterscotch until you open your nose. And when you open your nose, the air currents whoosh the volatiles up and you're tasting so your brain sends the olfactory information to the flavor area, and now it's butterscotch. You can do the same thing with jelly beans. We typically do it, and anyway, these are actually not bad uh, candies, but it's hard to talk with it, so I'll lay it down. That's just a picture. <clears throat> what we did, that's the candy I gave you. Now, as I said already, smell and flavor both have to use the olfactory nerve. Sniffing is the cue that tells the brain it's supposed to be smell. Taste is the cue that tells the brain it's flavor. We think oral touch may be somewhat useful here. We're not sure about that yet. So Aristotle's mistake wasn't corrected until 1810. And the guy who corrected this is really interesting. His name was William Prout. Now, William Prout was a student at the University of Edinburgh, just a student, and he wrote a student essay about how he couldn't taste nutmeg when he plugged his nose. Well, he was the first person to correctly distinguish between retronasal olfaction and taste. You would have thought that would have changed history. Actually, the only reference to his observation, by the way, he later published it in a paper, um, the only reference I've been able to find to his discovery is a friend of his mentioned it in a footnote <laughs> in a physiology book he translated. Boy, talk about not getting a discovery notice. But Prout became famous. He became a famous chemist physicist, and he was so he he worked on the hydrogen ion, and his work was so important that Rutherford, who'd won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1908, wanted to name the hydrogen ion the Prouton in his honor but the simpler proton won out. So you almost would have had as a household word, the name of the man who correctly identified flavor. Anyway, that it, failure in Aristotle, in fact, it wasn't correct until 1810. Look at the mess that's produced for us. Look at the verbs we have. Here, I, I say I taste food, you know what I mean. I smell food, you know what I mean. I flavor food. Whoops. It means you add flavor to food. There's no verb to describe the perception of flavor. So what do we do? We borrow taste. And you say, ooh, I taste that cinnamon. It's really good. No, you don't taste cinnamon. It's a flavor. But you ha haven't got a simple sentence you can use to explain that. Um, why didn't Aristotle get it wrong? All he had to do was plug his nose, and he ought to have noticed it. By the way, I checked. Uh, they did have apples back in the day. So Aristotle probably ate apples, and he bit into the apple. And if he plugged his nose, he would have noticed that the apple flavor would disappear, and the apple would just be sweet and sour. He was a smart man. He would have figured out that it was a different sensory experience. We probably would have had six senses. We would have had both uh, flavor and smell. So 
Um, I hunted and hunted online to find a good picture of somebody <laughs> eating some. This is the best I came up with. Anyway, Kate Hudson, Goldie Hawn's daughter, is I say she's eating blueberry yogurt because that's what we used in this experiment. We gave people blueberry yogurt and asked them where the blueberry sensation came from. And they said all over in the mouth. We then anesthetized taste on one side. And the blueberry flavor leaped to the other side. Now we anesthetized the tongue. The blueberry is coming from the olfactory system. What we did to the tongue had nothing whatsoever to do with what was going on in the nose. And yet the perception is the blueberry jumps to the side that has taste. So that was our first hint about what taste was, was really doing. Um, basically, taste analyzes non-volatiles. Olfaction handles volatiles. That's the first thing to remember. Um, and I put this up just because my students look at this and immediately have objections. The fact is, this is a picture of um, what the sensory characteristics are uh, of the nutrients. Fats have no taste and no smell. And you're going to argue that can't be true. Butter isn't like you know, canola oil. But what you're perceiving, other than the touch sensations, is all coming from impurities in the oil. Oil fats have molecules too large to be tasted or smelled. Carbs, yeah, the only carb we taste is sweet. And that's um, a series. You probably know a carbohydrate is basically a long string of glucose molecules, sugar molecules, which is why if you're a diabetic and you eat carbs, you might as well be eating sugar because it's going to break into sugar in your stomach. Proteins, no taste, no smell. And again, that's hard to believe. But the protein molecule itself is so large, it's too big to fit into receptors for taste or smell. So everything we taste that we think is coming from protein is coming from little bits of things mixed in with the protein, uh, probably from its source. And then you go down to those are the macronutrients that give us calories. You go down to the micronutrients, vitamins, and minerals. Well, Vitamins are too dilute, except for vitamin C. You would never taste them in food anyway. And if you did, yeah, they're awful. You, most of them are bitter. Uh, minerals are salty and bitter. And anti-nutrients, poisons, mostly bitter. Oh, isn't that interesting? As far as we know, the bitter taste modality developed in evolution as a poison detector. Now, why are we left liking any bitter at all today? Good question. Every time I tell, tell this to a class, somebody raises a hand and says, I love bitter. And I say, come to the lab. I'll give you a bitter you won't love. It's a matter of concentration. If I go high enough with concentration, I mean, I did this to myself because I, I just had to know. Uh, quinine is really quite soluble in water. You can make a really high concentration of quinine. And I made one, and I swallowed it. And it's like I had to hang on to the counter to keep from growing up. It was bad. There's just no way we like intense bitter because we are programmed. Our brains are programmed to make us dislike it. So uh, the only taste uh, qualities here among the nutrients come from their, their taste, sweet, salty, bitter. It's not very impressive. But you get the impression that for sweet, salty, and bitter, the taste system really has important nutritional consequences. And what's interesting, sugar and sodium are essential to survival. And if you eat bitters, you'll find out very quickly they're essential to survival, too, in the opposite direction. So immediately, you get the picture that taste has something very important to do. And you won't be surprised that taste affect the pleasure or displeasure from taste is wired into the brain. You're born this way. And it can't change it. Uh, very different with uh, uh, olfaction and flavor. Um, as I said, taste affect, we call it hardwired. But the affect that comes from olfaction, the pleasure you get from an olfactory stimulus, either smelled or perceived as flavor, is learned. Now, in some lower animals, some of it's hardwired. But in humans, we have no evidence that any of it is hardwired. It's all learned. I'll talk a little bit about that later. It would be nice to have some flavors and smells hardwired. 
but we can't prove that they are. And we've been working at it for quite a long time. Salty identifies sodium. Sweet identifies biologically useful sugars. Sour identifies acids that can burn. Bitter identifies poisons, nutrition. So taste analyzes the non-volatile nutrients that are critical for our survival. See, nutritional wise now, uh, nature used taste to solve problems that you have to solve right now or you die. And so they're hardwired into the brain. Olfaction solves problems that you've got a little time and you have a chance to learn. So we then become very focused on how do we learn to like or dislike um, these, these volatiles. Um, and I thought you might enjoy having me tell you just a bit about how um, the olfaction system does this, because it's really extraordinary. Now, I'm not an expert in olfaction, and I've been trying to figure out how to explain all this. So if it's not clear, let me know. But basically, the olfactory system is a labeling system. Think about an animal that doesn't have language. Very dependent on the sense of smell. Why? Because identifying smells is the key to survival for that animal. But that's learned. And by the way, a lot of it is socially learned. Even baby rat pups sniff their mother's mouths to get an idea of what's safe to eat. And it affects their dietary choices. So how does it work? Well, G protein coupled receptors. Uh, probably not too many people in the room even know what those are or care. But I'll show you a picture of one. Basically, it turns out that receptors all through the body, and by the way, we hunted for olfactory receptors for years. Turned out they're a special case of receptors that are all over the body. Didn't turn out to be too exciting in the final analysis, but what they are, most membranes in the body are made up of two layers of molecules. The outer layer likes fat, the inner layer likes water. And this protein is amazing. It simply cycles back and forth across the membrane like this seven times. And the apparatus that's formed on the outside is the receptor that can respond to different smells or tastes. The inside is the business that starts making messages that are sent to the brain. It's, that's how receptors work. On the outside, the receptor responds to whatever energy stimulus it's got to tell us about. And the inside develops the neural message that goes to the brain. So if we look at odors, oh, how many different odors are there that we can smell? Some people argue for a trillion, which I think is absurd. I don't know uh, if anybody could even find a trillion. But anyway, the olfactory system has a big problem because there are a lot of odors out there. So how is it going to have a receptor for everyone? It can't. So what we do is we look at the structure. And the beauty of an organic molecule and volatiles uh, for smell are organic molecules is basically they're a carbon brain that you hang functional groups on. Our olfactory receptors are not tuned to the molecule. They're tuned to the active groups on the molecule. And there are a lot fewer of them than there are different molecules. So we have about 400 types of olfactory receptors, and it's combinations of those that make up our ability to smell the odors that we smell. Now, the beauty is that the olfactory system basically sketches a picture of the chemistry of a molecule in the brain, which is really quite amazing. We have a lot of different receptor nodes. I'm going to change this to simpler language. Basically, up in the nose here, where the odors go. There's a lot of skin tissue, essentially a flat plane. Lots of receptors in there that respond to all kinds of different functional groups on these molecules. But amazingly enough, the olfactory system sorts them. So when they leave the nose and go to the brain, all of the ones that respond to the same chemical group go to one spot in the brain. And you end up with this picture. Uh, somebody had a sense of humor to do it this way. All of, like the blue ones, all gather together and go one blue. The area they go to in the brain is called a glomerulus, but it doesn't matter. It's just a bunch of cells. So here in the brain now, the chemistry of the molecule has been sorted out and laid out spatially. The brain can essentially take a picture of that and keep it in memory. So the brain is actually analyzing 
the chemical structure of a molecule. No wonder it gets so good at identifying different structures. What happens? Well, when it smell, and that's technically called orthonasal olfaction, um, it's basically telling us about things out there in the real world. When it's flavor, and that's retronasal olfaction, it's basically telling us about stuff that's in our mouths. So retronasal olfaction is identifying the molecules that are in your mouth. What happens to those? Well, taste has taken care of the ones that are immediate problems, either good or bad for you. So retronasal olfaction flavor is going to handle the ones that are likely to vary in the environment. And you've got to learn what molecules are important in your environment. So what do we do? We learn to like it if it's associated with things the brain says are good. And we learn to dislike it if it's associated with things the brain thinks are bad. Now here's the problem. The brain has certain ideas about what's good and bad that don't necessarily agree with what we believe as a species is good or bad based on a lot of science. So we're gonna find places where what our brain tells us to do and what we know better than to do are not gonna agree. Um, it's called the omnivore's dilemma. I love this, Paul Rosen coined that term. It was used later in a book by Michael Pollan. And rats, we love using rats because they're omnivores just like humans are. In order to survive, rats and humans have to avoid poisons. Bitter is hardwired to help with that. And also, we have to avoid substances that have made us sick. In order to survive, we must also select a diet that provides essential nutrients. Boy, that's tough. <laughs> so what was an early theory about this? Wisdom of the body. And you probably are going to run into hints of this theory because it's widely believed outside the scientific realm, that there's a lot of truth to this, that your body tells you what's good for you. Well, and there is some truth to that, but let's see if we can sort out the truth from what isn't so true. The idea, wow, William Harvey set up a lectureship, the Harvey Lectures, 1656. By 1923, Ernest Starling coined the term wisdom of the body in a Harvey lecture, and he was telling about hormones. 1932, Cannon wrote a book, The Wisdom of the Body, titled it that in honor of Starling. And this book is about homeostasis, the idea that a lot of things work in our bodies based on keeping us at an optimal level. For example, you run, you need more oxygen. What happens? You start to breathe faster. That brings more air in, your body returns to homeostasis. That's the basic idea here. And in 1943, Kurt Richter, added a new idea, specific hungers. Now it turns out that Richter says, when your body needs something nutritionally, you develop a craving for it. And you go out and you get it, you ingest it, and you bring your body back into homeostasis. Great idea. What was the early evidence for this? Specific hunger for salt, and this was a beauty. Uh, he took the adrenal glands out of rats and made their bodies lose sodium. They developed a craving for salt, and those rats kept themselves alive by ingesting the amount of salt they needed to survive. Their bodies were losing it constantly. Does this happen in humans? Well, there is a case that's very famous, and boy, this is just a heartbreaker. This is a little kid, and uh, Kurt Richter wrote this up for a, a medical journal. And this little boy craved salt, and his pediatrician said to his parents, oh, go ahead, let him have it, it won't hurt him. So he ate a lot of salt. Uh, he didn't do well, and he was put in the hospital, fed the regular ward diet. People just didn't realize he died after seven days. He'd been keeping himself alive for two and a half years by eating a lot of salt because his body was constantly losing it. And back then, we didn't know that a tumor of the adrenal gland would do this. The parents of this child were just remarkable and provided a complete account of his uh, behavior that Kurt Richter was able to study. It was really a really remarkable gesture on their part. Well, so we have a specific hunger for salt. If we need it, we like it better. And that is useful. So if you ever find yourself developing a craving for salt, don't ignore that. Talk to your doctor about it.
How about a specific hunger for sweet? Well, here, this is a wonderful story. Sacco um, was a guy working in Vienna. And we have a very distinguished psychiatrist here, uh, Joseph Wardis. He ultimately became a very famous psychiatrist. And he, as a young man, went over to Vienna to be analyzed by Freud. He wrote a book about it. Whoops. Thank you. He wrote a book about it. And this book about Freud is really <laughs> delightful. He didn't like Freud. He didn't think much of Freud. And he documented Freud's belief in mind reading. Um, once you know Freud believed in mind reading, it's a little hard to take him seriously on a lot of other things. Uh, Freud has a very bad reputation in my field. Experimental psychologists do not like Freud. Anyway, he was there in Vienna to be analyzed by Freud, but he went around and looked at a lot of other places too. And one of the places he dropped in on was Manfred Sockel's clinic. Well, Manfred Sockel was using insulin to cure schizophrenia. Why? The idea was that you had to rest the brain and let it heal. How can you rest the brain? Take all the sugar out so it's got no energy. Take it out with insulin. Knock the person down close to insulin uh, coma. And it lets the brain rest and the brain will self-heal. Well, empirically, this procedure was actually rather effective. So Wardis brought it back to the US and it got very popular. I don't think it really started getting knocked out until around the 1960s. Of course, it's very dangerous. You can kill somebody in an insulin coma. So it requires a lot of medical supervision. It's very expensive to do. And even though it did seem quite promising, it fell out of favor. Anyway, it disappeared in the 1960s, but not until people had observed something about the patients getting treated they developed what were called sugar rages. They developed tremendous appetites for eating sweet. Interesting. So Meyer Gross, 1946, actually set up an experiment, tested it, and sure enough, sweet taste preference went up when blue blood glucose went down. That is, the more you need sugar, the more pleasant it is, and the more you like it. I had to show this because Michelle Kabanak did this experiment. Michelle is a friend, and I love this experiment he did. Here, let's just imagine you're tasting sugar, a spoonful of sugar, every so often at intervals. If all you do is take it in your mouth and spit it out, the palatability, the pleasure of the sugar doesn't change. It stays sweet, and you like it. But if you swallow the sugar, the more you swallow, the less pleasant it gets over time. It's a beautiful experiment demonstrating that your need for sugar affects the pleasure it gives you. Again, we have our second source of evidence for wisdom of the body. Um, another evidence, piece of evidence sort of came along. Clara Davis was a pediatrician in Chicago, and she did not think that babies ought to be kept on milk so long. She thought they ought to be eating solid foods nutritionally. So somehow, she started with a, a smaller number, but eventually she tested 15. Um, nobody explains this, but there's a story here. And that is that Clara Davis managed to get legal um, authority over these children and uh, newly weaned and was able to put them in this experiment. We could never do this today. IR, IR, our IRB would never permit this experiment to be done today. Basically, these kids were sat next to a nurse, and the nurse was instructed only to help the child feed when he showed interest. So he's sitting with a tray with all these things on it, and the child can put his hand in, pick it up, do whatever he wanted to, no correction of his behavior, to sample all these foods and eat what he wants. Uh, Self-service diet. Well, what was interesting is that uh, this is the list of some of the things in the diet. You'll notice they're all healthy. Well, 1928 version of healthy. Um, and Clara Davis concluded these kids did incredibly well. They thrived. She actually eventually had uh, 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 authority over them until they were around 15 years old. These kids grew up to be very healthy. And a, a distinguished pediatrician, you'd think they would have done some nice measures of health status. Well, here's their measure of health status. This pediatrician, Joseph Brenneman, 
uh, wrote about them. I saw them on a number of occasions. They were the finest group of specimens from a physical and behavior standpoint that I've ever seen in children at that age. Well, that's impressive, not science, but that was it. That really caught on and it affected Dr. Spock. We all remember Dr. Spock. My students know who? They think Spock, Star Trek? So Dr. Spock's famous book, The Common Sense Book of Baby and Child Care, first edition in 1946, and it describes the Davis study in some detail and concludes trust an unspoiled child's appetite to choose a wholesome diet. Isn't that an interesting idea? Well, he softened it. And by his last edition, that wasn't really there anymore. It, it, it may be kind of a hint of it. But that idea is still out there. And people seem to think that really we often know, our bodies know what we should do. Well, in the 1960s, things were about to go wrong. Problem with the specific hungers experiments, uh, especially when they started looking at vitamins. Reinterpretation of Clara Davis's experiment. I'll just show you a little bit about what went wrong to show you why wisdom of the body was buried. The first one people started to look at was vitamin B1, thiamine, and that was important because if you are deficient in it, you get berry berry. Well, here's a, a 1642 description of berry berry. I mean, it, we've known this disease for a long time. I, I've never seen it, so it's hard for me to imagine, but um, obviously there's problems walking, tremor, paralysis, and there were parts of the world where berry berry was endemic. Uh, one of them I've circled right over there, and if I come a little closer, you'll see the island of Java was really afflicted with beriberi. And so that was a good place to go study it. And Christian Eichmann, who's a Dutch physician, ended up coming down with malaria. And it got him interested in tropical diseases. So he went to Java to study beriberi. He wanted to find the germ that caused beriberi. OK, because the germ theory was big then. So he was looking for a way to study it. And he noticed that the chickens uh, where he was appeared to have berry berry. So he thought, ooh, chickens, good experimental subject. So he took blood from patients, injected um, uh, chickens, and didn't inject other groups. But both groups were, got sick. So he started looking around. And it turns out that the chickens were fed white rice, leftovers from the army diet. But the army diet was changed to brown rice, and the chickens recovered. Aha! <laughs> well, we now know that the hull of a rice contains thiamine. It's one of the reasons that brown rice is better for you than white rice. So here we are. Eichmann has the wit to look at some human data. He looked at prison diets, because some prisoners ate white rice, some ate brown rice. Beautiful experiment. Turns out the ones that ate white rice got sicker than the ones with brown rice. Oh, he won the Nobel Prize uh, for this, um, 1929, for his role in the discovery of vitamins. So now we have something new to think about in nutrition. And think about uh, this specific hunger experiment that we did. And by the way, that was how the uh, first discovery with vitamin B1, they fed rats a diet that was deficient in B1, and they got very sick. They got very, very. Then they were given a choice of to continue the diet they were on or to switch to a diet that had thiamine in it. And boy, they switched immediately to the thiamine diet. No learning required. Why? Specific hunger. So that was what made people believe there were going to be specific hungers for vitamins. And then it's very interesting. Paul Rosen did the experiment a slightly different way. He made the rats sick. He let them choose between the original diet that didn't have thiamine in, another diet that had the same flavor but also had uh, thiamine in it, and a third diet that had no thiamine but had a novel flavor. And the rats immediately went for the deficient diet with a different flavor. They weren't learning to respect, they weren't learning to find thiamine at all. They were learning to avoid the diet they were sick on and grab anything that had a different flavor. So now we are understanding a little bit about conditioning with flavor. Um, the name that was applied to that is conditioned aversion. So we have a new view now. Wisdom of the body is out. New view. We have conditioned preferences. 
Pair a new food with pleasure, it becomes liked. Pair a food with displeasure, particularly nausea, is very effective, and it becomes disliked. Have any of you ever gotten nauseated and not been able to touch that food again? Usually I get a good response from undergraduates who had alcohol for the first time. Um, we get a beautiful, beautiful conditioned aversion. So now we have taste that handles hardwired stuff that nature knows is good or bad for us and it hardwires us to respond to them that way. And we have flavor which handles learning. If you have a, the flavor of a diet gets pleasurable, if you associate it with another pleasurable experience, that flavor gets unpleasurable if you associate it with anything that's not pleasurable and mostly what works is nausea. Why is this important? Well, because taste and flavor are generally studied by completely different people, <laughs> different groups. And if we wanna learn about this, some of us have to actually learn about both tastes and flavors. And that's what I've been able to do with the University of Florida, which is really wonderful. So preferences, we're born liking sweet. Soon after birth, our salt receptors mature and we like salty taste. Um, we dislike bitter and I always have to hand wave with sour because most people don't like intense sour. But have you ever seen these horrid candies, mega warheads that kids like? <laughs> Horribly sour. We, we don't quite know. We think that's a different phenomenon. <laughs> anyway, pleasure is the way the brain tells us that it thinks something is good for us, which is most of the time it's right. Um, displeasure is the way the brain tells us it thinks something is bad for us. But I'll show you some examples where the brain makes a mistake. And by the way, the problem, imagine evolution doesn't care about us after we produce our kids. We're just scrap heap then. Some of the substances we like, sweet, salty, fat, can become a problem. We don't have mechanisms to turn off our liking of these substances when they become um, much too much an important part of our diets. So our love of salt and sugar and fat is survival. It keeps us going when we're born but it unfortunately produces chronic diseases later in life. And we don't have anything except our brains to stop us from suffering from those. Okay, um, so we learn to like nutritious foods if they affect us in ways our brain defines as good. So basically, if you start to feel bad, your brain starts to suspect something is wrong in your diet. Get off. <laughs> um, and there are, here are some things that produce positive associations. Our brain loves the stimulation in coffee, caffeine. It loves alcohol. It loves drugs. Isn't that a shame? So drugs of abuse pair beautifully with flavors and make flavors liked better. It's one of the problems when people try to kick drugs is that all the flavors that are common in their lives are cues to remind them of the drug experience. Uh, it also has some implications for cuisine. Um, why do we use so many different flavors? Well, it's because of satiation. And I was going to, I want to get quickly to, um, let's skip all this. I'm going to tell you about the reinterpretation of Clara Davis's experiment. Remember Clara Davis thought her kids just did incredibly well because their bodies knew what they should eat? <laughs> Not at all. All the food she gave them were healthy. All they had to do was eat a variety and they'd be healthy. And it never occurred to her that that's exactly what they did. They satiated on one and switched to a different one. In other words, sheer boredom with one food is what made those kids so healthy. And that boredom has been studied. It's called sensory specific satiety. Um, one of the beautiful examples of this, imagine we have a group of children and I have just brought a huge bowl of M&Ms in and I tell the kids eat all you want, pig out, eat as much as you can. And they do. Then I take that bowl away and I bring a tray in. It's got a little bowl of potato chips, a little bowl of peanuts, a little bowl of M&Ms, etc. Guess which bowl they don't touch? The little bowl of M&Ms. They've satiated, satiated on it. They want to move on. And it's also called the smorgasbord effect. You ever been at a smorgasbord, gotten totally satiated, then they bring out the lobster? right back, eat the lobster. 
Um, this has been studied very thoroughly by Barbara Rawls, and this is a very important uh, phenomenon for nutrition because it pushes us to eat a variety, and eating a variety is one of the keys to good health. Um, I want to briefly tell you, we've got just about five minutes left, about what we're doing. Now that we know that flavor and taste are so different, we can study them and how they interact, and we're having a lot of fun doing that at the University of Florida. Some of you have heard me talk about the tomato project. Um, I will update that a bit, show you just a little bit farther uh, how we've gone. But basically, our first project, and this is a case where the sensory people started hanging out with the, the botanists. And the botanists, the horticulture people at the university, wanted to make important crops taste better. They wanted important fruits and vegetables for the state of Florida to taste better. It was a competitive move for our state agriculture. Well, um, that's what some of us study in the senses, is palatability. I'm very interested in measuring it. Um, anyway, this is Charlie Sims and me. This is Harry Klee, who's one of the world's experts on tomato volatiles. Here's his uh, assistant, but she's really a molecular biologist who happens to be a farm girl and knows how to raise tomatoes. <laughs> that was very useful. We did a tomato project, 80 tomatoes, do the chemical analysis, do the sensory analysis, find out what's in them and find out how much people like them. And mathematically, we can detect how much each constituent contributes to the liking. Well, we did that, and we can essentially plot each constituent against liking. And you'll notice some of the functions go up. That means the more of that there is in it, the more you like it, like glucose. The sweeter a tomato is, the better people tend to like it. The more ethyl vinyl ketone you have in the tomato, more people like it. The more isobutyl acetate, the more they don't like it. Well, guess how you can make a better tomato? Take out the stuff that makes them disliked and put more of the stuff in that makes them liked. And boy, does it work. <laughs> uh, that's what we're doing at the moment. But while we did this experiment, we made a serendipitous discovery. And here it is. We had all these data. So I plotted sweetness against sugar concentration. And get a load of that uh, a function. Look at the scatter. If the only thing that made a tomato sweet was sugar, all the points would be on that line. But they're not. Something else is affecting the sweetness. Probably several things. What could it be? Well, we decided it was probably volatile, so we ran mathematical models, and the models picked out which volatiles were adding sweet to the tomato. Wow. Now we can, if we were allowed to, genetically engineer a tomato as sweet as we want just by making it produce threat. Well, we can't do that. We're not allowed to do that. So we have to crossbreed them the old-fashioned way. So you can do that, and you can produce some good stuff that way. Um, and basically, I'm trying to find the best one to show you this. Uh, we took the volatiles we identified in the tomatoes, and we took the volatiles we identified in the strawberries. So we put both of these sets of volatiles that enhance sweet together in a sugar solution. Well, the sugar got sweeter. Isn't that useful? So now we can take those volatiles out of the fruit. We can put them in anything we want. They don't add a sweet taste themselves. They enhance whatever sweet taste is already there from the sugar that is in the fruit. They do it in the brain by altering the message for sweet. So the flavor message comes up the olfactory nerve, these volatiles producing flavor, and somehow, some of that goes to the same area of the brain that processes taste and can enhance taste. It turns out we have about 100 volatiles that will enhance sweet, and we have quite a number that will enhance salty. So imagine how convenient this is going to be if you want to make something taste salty without having a lot of sodium in it. You put a little sodium in, and then you add all of the volatiles that enhance sodium. Well, it works. Um, I, this is one of my favorite slides. My friend uh, Thomas Calhoun put this one together. We plotted total sugar against perceived sweetness for the little red dots are tomatoes, the big circles are strawberries, and the blue dots are blueberries. Now notice something about this. Notice that these have different varieties of strawberry, different varieties of blueberry. You can only do this someplace in an ag school where they grow all of these. This was expensive. 
and they were being grown for other reasons, so we didn't have to pay for that. So here, look at this. Look at the strawberries and the blueberries. They're about, these different varieties occupy the same range of sweetness variation. But look at the sugar content. The strawberries have way less sugar than the blueberries. So we now know that when you bite into a blueberry and it's sweet, you're tasting the sugar. But when you bite into a strawberry and it's sweet, you're tasting a little of the sugar, but you're tasting a lot of the enhanced sweet message in the brain because of the volatiles. Very useful. Now, you can do it with salty also. And this is sort of what I want to end with, because this is what perhaps to me was the most exciting of all. Imagine somebody now with a disordered taste system. Something has damaged their taste nerve. It doesn't work as good as it should. We can, if they can taste at all, we can add, for example, I had a patient who couldn't taste sugar very well. It was too weak to her, but she tasted it. So I took the 56 of our 100 volatiles that enhance sweet and added them to sugar and gave her the volatile sugar solution. And it tasted normally sweet to her. I had enhanced whatever sweet message was in her brain by sending up information about the volatiles through the olfactory nerve, which bypassed the damaged taste nerve. So using these volatiles, we have a chance to restore taste in people in whom it has been dimmed. And this may be the most fun of all. Theoretically, we can test the patient, decide what they're missing, identify the volatiles that will restore normal function and give them normal sensory experiences of taste. We're nowhere near doing that yet, but I'm hoping that'll happen. Probably not in my lifetime, <laughs> but thank you very much. Any questions? When will the tomatoes be on the market? Um, the, the, the first tomato, you can actually get seeds for it. If you want to make a small contribution to Harry Clee's lab, he'll send you seeds for call, uh, the tomato called the Garden Gym, which he crossbred between an heirloom tomato that was a sickly plant, but the tomatoes were fantastic, and a modern plant that was a healthy plant with lousy tomatoes. And he got the healthy plant with the good tomatoes, and those are Garden Gems. It's like eating fruit. They are wonderful. Any questions? Okay. There's one with each. Oh, go ahead. <clears throat> Could you tell us about how umami became a flavor? Good old umami. Uh, I'm afraid I am in the opposite camp when it comes to umami. Umami was discovered in the, oh God, was it before the 40s uh, because it was used as a condiment, seaweed that had it or something. It was used as a condiment in Japan. And an enterprising chemist purified the stuff and found out it was monosodium glutamate. And monosodium glutamate was marketed as a taste enhancer in the US um, accent the company that makes Accent uh, marketed it, so it had that name. You can still buy it. And it was advertised, even for people on low-sodium diets. The idea is you add this to your, sprinkle it on your food, and it enhances the normal salt taste. And wow, it's great for people on low-sodium diets. The only problem is that monosodium glutamate isn't a salt enhancer at all. It's a sodium salt. But it's a sodium salt with a big anion, and anions are inhibitory in taste. So when you taste the same amount of sodium and monosodium glutamate, you taste about a third of the saltiness. So when you sprinkle that MSG on your food, you're actually tripling your sodium intake. Not too smart. And I wrote a letter to that effect to the Journal of the American Medical Association, and woo, <laughs> you don't want to mess with those people. Um, they wrote back some pretty incendiary responses, and JAMA sent me the letters in their original envelopes. And I looked at one from a guy who claimed to be the president of the International Glutamate Technical Committee. 
And I recognized the return address as a little town in Massachusetts, and I knew that accent was made in that town. So I took a look at Gray's register, and lo and behold, the president of the International Technical Committee was actually a safety officer at Accent and had an ax to grind. So we outed him. And to this day, the MSG people send most taste people who work on umami free to meetings. Not moi. <laughs> I do not get anything <laughs> from them, nor would I take it if they offered. Um, there's nothing wrong with umami. It actually has a lot of very important functions, but umami works in the gut. Uh, monosodium glutamate um, stimulates glutam glut glutamate, uh, glutamate receptors that are in the stomach. And basically, if you're eating something and uh, it, 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 say a protein has glutamate in it, and the protein's broken up to its amino acids in your gut, the responsiveness of these uh, glutamic acid fibers will tell your brain you ate protein. So that's, it's glutamate actually is the marker for protein in the brain, and the brain will make you like the food better if it had glutamate in it, because it meant you ate protein. So the idea of adding MSG to food wasn't stupid commercially, because you add MSG to food, you're going to start liking that food better. It's good for sales, but not as a taste enhancer. It's not a taste enhancer. And they're beginning to advertise it that way again. So I think I'm going to have to write another letter to JAMA. Mm -hmm. We have a question on Zoom. Hi, Deborah, go ahead. Um, I have a question about all the interest in hot sauce these days. So many hot sauces and so much uh, uh, so much of added flavor seems to be with heat. What is that about? That's a wonderful point. Uh, one of my students, Jennifer Stamps, um, was studying people with weakened taste systems. Uh, we don't know what the cause was clinically, but they were having trouble recognizing flavor. And Jennifer started adding hot sauce to some things. And she felt that they were getting better flavor recognition. I'm sorry that she got her PhD and left and is off in the world now. We never pursued that. But it's a possibility that hot sauce has a benefit for people who have reduced taste perception. It may help them perceive flavor because burn in the mouth may add somehow to taste to intensify the flavor signals in the brain. Uh, that's really worth, we should do that. It's really worth clinically following up. But what else? Well, first of all, let me tell you, there's genetic variation in hot sauce. And if I still had probe papers, I would have given everybody a little circle of white paper that would be bitter. And it would be more bitter to some people than others. And the people who tasted it as the most bitter would have more pain fibers in their tongue and they would get much more burn from chili peppers. It's a factor of at least two or three. That is a jalapeno pepper. I am a non-taster and I eat a jalapeno pepper, pepper. I know there's some heat in there, but it's really mild. Probably that's not true for most of you in the room about jalapeno peppers. Um, I could probably take a crack at a habanero. I haven't done it. Although I do admit after reading some uh, very interesting literature, I did desensitize my tongue to 10,000 parts per million capsaicin. It really hurt a lot, <laughs> but it doesn't damage your tongue. Uh, the beauty of these uh, chemicals that burn is they stimulate pain receptors, but they don't do any damage. Uh, so why do people like the burn? Well, Paul Rosin did a wonderful study in Mexico, and he observed the acquisition of chili pepper preference in children. And it turns out, it's social. The really small children don't like hot pepper. They sit at the table, but they watch their parents and their older siblings eating it. So, and it's on the food, so they try it. And it's a conditioned preference. Uh, try to produce this in an animal. We tried with a lot of animals. You just don't teach animals to like hot pepper with one exception. If it's a pet and the pet is getting food from you and sees you eating the hot pepper, and you're giving him your food, the, the, what is it, empathy? The pet will try the hot food and will eat the hot food. And, and we did, uh, we, I say Ben Galef, who was a student of Paul Ross, and did 
succeed in getting some rats to develop a preference for mild chili pepper. And he did it by uh, having them watch another rat consume uh, hot pepper. They acquired it socially. So it's very interesting that a hot pepper can produce, uh, it can be loved as a, as a condition preference. I love it now. I just love putting hot pepper on stuff. Uh, and I did not when I first came east. So I acquired it socially from friends and my husband. I think she has a follow up, Deb. Does it not uh, affect your gastric lining? Oh, yeah. Um, however, maybe not the way you think. When we were doing research at Yale with hot peppers, um, I ran into trouble with the IRB. They didn't want me to give it to anybody who might have lesions in their mouth or ulcers. They thought that would be dangerous. And I had to introduce them to the literature that proves that exposing wounds to capsaicin, which is what makes hot pepper burn, actually uh, enhances healing. We think it may be through blood flow. It may increase blood flow and you get more blood coming to the area. So that actually putting capsaicin in food is good for ulcers. I know that may sound fine. It isn't pleasant. And so most doctors will tell you to eat what you want to eat uh, and don't eat anything that bothers you if you have an ulcer. But as far as being bad for lesions, just the contrary. Thank you. Pat Hardin, I saw that you had your hand raised. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Pat Hardin had her hand raised. Yes, um, I'll pass on the peppers. But I have some friends who, if there's even the smallest bit of MSG in the food, he gets a horrible migraine. Yes. And through years of testing and isolation, that is the one ingredient. And I wonder if you had an explanation for that. There is a very extensive literature on, on what MSG does that's bad for you. Um, there was a big row about this back in the 60s, and it led ultimately to MSG being forbidden in baby food, which is, I think, a good thing. Um, MSG uh, can cross the blood-brain barrier, can get into the brain, and it causes neurological symptoms But in some people. It doesn't do it to everyone. The people who get a reaction to it can get very ill. Migraine is, is bad enough. There's a shuddering syndrome that's associated with it. It doesn't affect most people. So if you try to follow that literature, uh, the people who sell MSG took great exception to it. They actually tried to ruin the career of one of the early investigators who worked on this. When they went after me, I called him up. I said, what do you do with these people? He said, well, they'll make a lot of noise, but they're basically harmless. That is, they don't come and shoot you. Well, that was nice to know. Anyway, uh, the MSG people I ended up not being very happy with because of the way they treated that gentleman. Uh, Dr. Olney was his name. Uh, so the idea is if you are bothered by MSG, stay away from it. It's, it's related to a brain neurotransmitter substance, and it's probably acting as a neurotransmitter in some people. We really don't know for sure. It, it wasn't, nobody really wants to work on this problem. Can you imagine why? Uh -huh. Yes, I can. Um, this sounds sadly familiar with most things. You can go back to nicotine and cigarettes and go right on down the line to pesticides, insecticides, food products. Those who make the profit don't like the studies. Similar, similar story with artificial sweeteners. Yes. Thank you. Okay, another question here, Anne. Yes, um, uh, medications al and alternation, alteration of taste sensation. Oh boy. Um, yes, a lot of them do. And some of them we know about, and some of them we don't. Here's the problem. Uh, if you, you, doctors get letters from patients saying, you know, I had trouble with my taste when I was on this drug or something. Well, trouble is what they mean by the word taste. Um, I saw a patient, we were, Yale had a, a clinic with the University of Connecticut, and I saw a patient at the University of Connecticut, and she told me that she just had a terrible taste problem with food. And so I said, look, uh, we don't know much about this. Let's go with the cafeteria. We'll eat together. We'll have lunch. 
and you'll tell me what you experience all through lunch. And we'll see if I can figure out what's going on. It's always really important to listen to the patient, try to get inside their experience. And so she ordered a tuna fish sandwich. So we sit down, she takes a bite. Ugh, this is just awful. And I said, well, what does it taste like? And she said, tuna fish. You see, when she meant taste, she meant distaste. She didn't like it. And that's the problem with the language we use. Doctors get these reports from patients, and they're not sure. They think it's a sensory complaint, but it's not. It's a complaint that really is more about appetite. So in order to diagnose patients correctly, you really need to have them in the clinic, and you need, really need to test them. And you need to be sure you don't have confusions like this in language. But do some medicines affect taste? Oh, you bet. Um, there's a medicine that's used to treat interocular pressure, and I can't remember its name. It, it has a, tor a terrible effect. Uh, you can't taste champagne. <laughs> it was first reported by, uh, it also is related to mountain sickness, and it first was reported with a group of people who got to the top of a tall mountain and couldn't taste the champagne they brought to toast their success. Um, I, I, the mechanism for that one is known. I can't recall it right at the moment, but I can certainly look it up. It's di very difficult because in order to study these effects, you have to get patients who are on the medication and off. You either have to follow them on and off, or you have to get two different groups. Now, if you're going to get two groups, you have the problem of comparing different people. And this is a measurement problem I've actually spent a good part of my career on. How do I know how sweet something is to you? You tell me it's really sweet. How does that relate to my really sweet? We don't have a clue. So the way we started to study this, believe it or not, we put earphones on people. We say, turn the sound of this tone until it's as loud as your Coke is sweet. Well, that's cross-modality matching. People are really good at it. When we did this, I didn't tell you anything about super tasters. These people are born with extra taste buds. They taste things about twice as intense as everybody else. And uh, we brought super tasters in. We had them do this experiment. And they matched the sweetness of a Coke to 90 decibel tone. And the rest of us matched the sweetness of a Coke to an 80 decibel tone. Now, we know a lot about hearing. So we know that 10 decibels is a factor of two. So we know that the super tasters were matching the taste of sweet to them to a sound twice as loud as the rest of us were. So we concluded that they were tasting twice as sweet. And that's how we've done all of our comparison studies. But unless you can do a method like that, you can't compare patients to controls. Um, so these medication studies, a number of them have been done, and the results are invalid because they didn't make the correct comparison. And that's a lot of invalid work. Now, if you do it smart and do it people, they go on, they go off, whatever, you, you can show it, but it's expensive. And it, the NIH won't support work like that. They couldn't care less. Sorry, say that again. Uh, metabolites in the medications? Oh, you mean try to figure out the mechanism. Actually, that's probably the smartest way to do it. Look what's in there and try to see if anything is already known about those things. Um, we ought to do more clinical work. And the problem is that, as I say, the government won't pay for it. Um, most uh, companies that make the pharmaceuticals won't pay for it. They don't want anybody to be that sure it produces taste problems. Uh, companies that sell food won't pay for it. So we do them sometimes as student theses. You know, we can slip them in as just part of our basic research. But it's very difficult to do that work, and we ought to do it, because the effects are real. All right, thank you. Um, there was one question up there that said, how would you define flavor? I know you've talked about that. Oh, sorry? The, in chat, it says, how would you define flavor? How would I define flavor? Flavor is retronasal olfaction. It is the signal produced by input up the olfactory nerve that goes to the part of the brain that is accessed when taste is the cue. And that sensation 
is what you get when you do the candy demo. Well, you hold your nose. Go home and try it with a chocolate bar or try it with something you eat for dinner. Hold your nose, put it in your mouth, chew it, swallow it, and get what sensation you get. You may get sweet, salty, sour, bitter. You won't get flavor. Open your nose and you get flavor. And I would define it that way. You want to uh, make a comment about why Harry had to use classical crossing to get all of his tomatoes? Say that again. You want to make a comment about why Harry had to use classical genetic crossing to get all his different tomatoes? I mean, why we can't do it with uh, genetic engineering? Well, if any of you have ever heard Ken Folta talk about GMOs, if you haven't had that pleasure, I hope you get it someday, because he tells you about all the wonders of GMOs. I think GMOs have been given a, a terrible reputation they don't deserve. And we ought to be doing all kinds of things with genetic engineering because of all the good it would bring. Um, if we could genetic engineer, oh, wow, uh, could I give you a strawberry? We, I didn't tell you this part. We've just discovered some volatiles in strawberries that uh, suppress sweet. Isn't that nice? So it turns out that we can make all those strawberries sweeter just by taking it out. And we never knew that. And now it turns out we can probably do that with all kinds of things. So now we have two tools. We can enhance a taste and we can suppress the taste. We know how to do that. Um, we can suppress the bitter in medications to make them more palatable to children. Of course, maybe that's not such a great idea. <laughs> so the irony is that if you make genetic changes and you know what you've done, that's a no-no. <sighs> but if you make genetic changes by classic crosses and you have no idea what you've done, then that's perfectly yeah, okay yeah. to sell the people. I know. It makes no sense, does it? Uh, and I'm not an expert on this. I express my opinion. And fortunately, people who have the opposing opinion just assume I don't really know anything about this. And they're actually quite right. Um, but it is, it is very sad. The people I work with in IFAS have persuaded me uh, that we could be doing so much good for people. And you know, the whole idea of trying to make things more palatable, and the reason I started working with this crowd in horticulture here is because um, you can't change people very easily. You can only do it with these conditioned preferences and aversions. It's really not what you want to do. It's easier to change the food and make it something that the person already likes. I was asked once at a wine meeting in Australia, they said, well, we want you to tell us the flavors we should put in wine so that they'll sell. And I said, you got it backwards. I said, you take your flavors and you figure out how to condition a preference for them in the population. Give free samples. Have a celebrity <laughs> recommend it. Uh, pair it with a filet mignon. You know, you, there are all kinds of ways you could make it like better and you'll have more, more success. You're, you're suggesting that Oprah needs a wine club. <laughs> <laughs> well, we thank you again for quickly rallying to get this presentation together today.